Hey guys, Chris Peach here, and welcome to the Money Peach Podcast. Hey, do you remember growing up learning how to handle money? Yeah, neither do I. So that's why we're here today, to make your money fun again. You know, we're going to talk about the principles in life that actually matter when it comes to managing your money in a way that works. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of the Money Peach Podcast. Before we jump into another amazing episode of the Money Peach Podcast, I want to take a second to talk to you guys about my free live training event, Stop Living Paycheck to Paycheck and Just Live. Join me each week on this live webinar where I show you the four-step system we use to go from living paycheck to paycheck to later paying off $52,000 in debt in only seven months. And as a bonus for joining me on this live training, I'll be answering any questions you may have during the live Q&A session at the end. So head on over to moneypeach.com forward slash webinar to get registered. Welcome back, everyone, to another amazing episode of the Money Peach Podcast. I'm Chris Peach. This is episode 50. Can I just say that one more time? This is episode 50. This is a huge moment for the show. I'm super excited to be bringing on two guests on today's show that tie a lot of the most listened to, downloaded episodes together. You see, a lot of the episodes that we've done on the show, I tell the guests or I share with you guys that we met at the gym. Well, what is this gym? This gym I've been talking about is a CrossFit gym in Peoria, Arizona called CrossFit Incendia. And on the show today, I'm bringing on the owners and the founders of CrossFit Incendia, Brian and Lisa Veda, to tell you their amazing story about a husband and wife had an idea on a road trip that turned into their passion, that turned into a business, and now has changed the lives of hundreds and hundreds of people that have been part of this gym for the last five years. So without further ado, let me bring on my dear friends, Brian and Lisa Veda from CrossFit Incendia. All righty, Brian and Lisa Veda, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's special for me to have you guys on the show. This is episode 50. This is kind of a big deal for me. I was reading somewhere that, you know, if you make it to 50 episodes, only a small percentage of people make it to 50, then even less make it to 100. So one of my milestones was make it to 50. And then I was thinking, okay, 50 episodes in has to be special. There has to be something. And it came to me. I said, a good majority of the people on the show... I met through the gym. I always talk about, you know, I met John Gaston in episode 38. I met him from the gym. Um, Mill Mac Industries, I met him from the gym. And there's been, you know, four or five other guests. George Lawton, I met him from the gym. And we always talk about meeting at the gym. So I thought, how fitting would it be if I had the people that created this gym, created this idea, come on the podcast, episode 50, tie it all together, and kind of share your story because it is unbelievable to say the least. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on my good friends, personally good friends, Brian and Lisa Veda. So thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Oh, thank you. It's an honor. Brian, tell me a little bit about, we'll start with you. Where did you grow up? I mean, give me a little bit of background of, about you. Uh, I grew up in Phoenix, uh, 35th Avenue and the 101, so just about a five-minute drive down the road from here. I mm-hmm. uh, went to my elementary school, was right by my, you know, right through the neighborhood, went there from K through 6, uh, then junior high, and then high school at Goldwater, uh, 27th in your Valley. So uh, my family still live in that same house, the house I grew up in. My mom and dad are still there, even though all the kids are out, which is nice, right down the road, so we can kind of, with the grandkids nice and close and see them a lot. So you have this gym, right? Has fitness always been a part of your life? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. My parents were runners. You know, as early as I can remember going to, you know, the Phoenix New Times 10Ks and going to 5K races on the weekends with my parents. And actually, my dad signed me up for my first gym membership at Bally's at 30, or sorry, 27th and Greenway. It's not even there anymore. It's an office building. Mm -hmm. But I was, I think, 11 years old or maybe 12 when I signed up. And he signed me up because I was tall and figured they wouldn't ask any questions. I think you had to be 13 to be a membership member there. So that was my first gym experience at, uh, when I was 13, 12 years old at Bally's. And I would go with my mom and dad and, you know, my younger brother and sister would go in the kids' room and hang out there. And I would go and just walk around and, you know, jump on some treadmills, jump on a machine here and there and just pretend to know what I was doing. So it's fair to say you're, you own a gym, right? Fitness has always been a part of your life. Yeah. Always been a part of your life. You're very, very fit. We're going to put some pictures up of you on the podcast. I don't know if we're going to allow any shirtless pictures on there, but you're very, very fit <laughs> for being an old man. All right. So now I want to transition. Master's to, athlete. Please. Master's athlete. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. Now I want to transition into Lisa. So Lisa, tell me about you. Where did you grow up? Where are you from? And kind of give me a little bit of background about you. 
I grew up in Buckeye, Arizona, which is a little town south of Phoenix. Well, it was a little town. It's much bigger now. My family has been from that neighborhood or from that city for five generations. So I went to Buckeye Elementary School and Buckeye Union High School. I went to the same high school as my mom, my dad, and my grandmother. So my family is still very much embedded in Buckeye. My grandparents still live there. My mom still works there. And I just grew up like any normal small town girl. So you're a small town girl. Brian, you're in the city, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Small town girl, fitness, part of your life growing up? Not whatsoever. (laughs) Not whatsoever. Now, I will say, we could cut this out if you don't want me to say this, but I know you as, you know, when you were younger, you were a Hooters girl. I was. And they don't hire Hooters girls that don't look fit, right? So your fitness wasn't a part of your life, but I mean, you were always in really good shape, or at least you looked like you were in really good shape. I was skinny fat. Skinny fat. And I actually had a woman tell me I was skinny fat when we lived in Verado, and I was so offended by that. And it was because I had no fitness level. It was before I started CrossFit. It's funny who had somebody call you out. Um, we're going to talk about Brian calling me out, because I think that, <laughs> that, was, that was a life changer for me. It helped me out a lot. So we're going to talk about that. So where did you guys meet then? Small town girl, city guy. Opposite ends of Phoenix area, you know, how did you guys end up meeting? Um, We both worked for Hensley. It's the local Budweiser distributor here in Phoenix. I started off there when I was 19, I believe, working in the shop, running parts. As soon as I turned 21, I was able to drive a truck. I did a little bit of uh, just a short stint merchandising and driving a truck before I got into marketing, where I met Lisa. And we both were on the what's called the CMT, the Contemporary, Contemporary Marketing Team. Bar promotions, special events, all, you know, the NASCAR World Series, all the fun stuff that you know in your, your early twenties you want to do, and that's where we uh, we met and started working together, and that was it. It was one of those <laughs> things where when you met Lisa, she just couldn't keep her hands off you, right? She was just so enamored with you that pretty much, yeah, pretty. That's how I remember it. Yeah, that's um, yeah. <laughs> and and I thought his name was Brad. I didn't know his <laughs> name <yeah>. was Brian. <laughs> yeah, that's true. This guy's really cute. His name's Brad for the last time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Okay. So then let's talk about Brian and I meet. Um, for those of you who do not know, Brian and I actually got hired the exact same day with the fire department and we went through the same academy. And then inside the academy, what they do is they take, I think we had about 40 people in our academy and they divide people up into what they call engine companies. So you have a captain who is like going to be your personalized mentor through that process. And you and I not only get put in the same academy, we get put in the same engine company, which was like four or five of us, correct? Uh, yeah, five of us. Five sort of us. Yeah, five. And uh, so we never met before, but I, you know, we became buddies in the academy. This is in 2007. And then we come out of the academy and a year later, we get on the same truck together. We work at the same station and we actually, this is when we were looking at CrossFit.com. That was the only CrossFit oh, yeah. I knew about. That was the main, they called the main site. You know, we heard rumblings, you know, guys and you know, guys on the job trying this new crazy thing called CrossFit. So I remember we me and you would get on the computer and we go to CrossFit.com and we look at the workouts and a lot of it we didn't even know what it was. So they had a they had an exercise demo library. So if the workout was, you know, overhead squats and running, we'd be like, Okay, I don't really know what overhead squat I could picture it. So they had an exercise demo and you'd, you'd click on the overhead squat and it would teach you how to overhead squat via a YouTube video. And that's pretty much how we learned every movement in CrossFit. We would go look at a workout, like, hey, that looks like a fun one to try. We'd watch the video on how to do it. And then we would do a makeshift version of it at the station. Back in when we were on the Ambos again in 2008, functional fitness wasn't a huge priority of the fire department. We did a lot of skills core stuff, sled pushes, tire drags, but that was really it. There was no bumper plates, kettlebells, pull-up bars, anything like that at the fire station. So we actually, me, Chris, and our captain, who was uh, the engine captain who was in the CrossFit at the time, built pull-up bars out back of Station 9. Yeah. The funny thing is I remember there was a big storm that came through Phoenix, huge storm, and it knocked over all these wooden telephone poles. And we literally went and got these telephone poles that – I don't know if we were allowed to do this. We never asked. We never asked. Um, (laughs) We took them. (laughs) They're still city property, I believe. Yeah. Repositioned them. Yeah, moving from one point to another. And uh, so we dug these pits in the back of the station, and we had the ladder set them in place, and we buried them, and then we used – conduit for electrical conduit as the pull-up yeah, bar. The pull-up bar, yeah. And uh, that was in 2008. And it's still there. It's still there. It's still yeah. there, and guys are still using them. Now they have a pretty good setup at Station 9, bumper plates, kettlebells, and they have pull-up bars right out back by the grass. It's, it's amazing. We used to do them on the hose tower, mm-hmm. which was about, a you know, I think a two-and-a-half-inch round pipe. That was hose hard. tower is where you hang. Them. They used to have the hoses would be wet after fire, so they would hang them from these huge towers. So we thought, well, we can make pull-up bars out of this. But yep. what we ended up doing was better. I remember, too, 
one of the motivations we had when we were starting CrossFit is we were watching all these videos and there was a workout called Nasty Girls. Oh, yeah. And there was all these girls that were doing these, this movement that was like this elusive movement called the muscle up. And at the time, we could not do one. And we would watch these girls and they were doing them no problem. And I remember thinking in my mind, I'm not okay with this. I'm not okay <laughs> with these girls being able to do these muscle ups so easily. And I would say in CrossFit, you know, I think anybody that's listening that does CrossFit, the muscle up is kind of that pinnacle point, you know, like a standard, yeah, like a standard, like you want to do it so bad. Everyone remembers their first muscle up. Yeah, there you go. Everybody remembers first muscle up. So I remember you and I, I think we got them on the same day. Yep. But we, so we actually, there was no rogue fitness back then. So we made our own rings in the um, oven, in the oven at the fire station, which the guys weren't too happy about because we melted PVC pipe in the oven that we cook food in. Yeah. Shaped them into rings, ran some webbing through them, yep. some straps, and hung them from a tree branch. Before we had them. our homemade pull-up bars, we ran them through a tree. Yeah. And that's how we got our muscle-ups. We just practiced and practiced, watched videos, practiced, and got them there. So we're going to keep talking about where the gym is now, but it's so funny just that – they're not funny. It's, it's, it's amazing to think that this love of CrossFit was hanging ropes from trees and telephone poles you know, at the fire station. Nine years ago? Yeah, 10 years ago. Actually, it was 10 years ago, yeah. yeah. So you and I – we ended up leaving the station, and so you go to the opposite end of the city as me. So we no longer work together, but you are – you're working in an area. You're living in an area where they have like the – what is it? The second or third CrossFit gym Yeah, we were, living, we were living out west uh, in Goodyear and Buckeye at the time. Um, we lived at a house in Goodyear, and we moved a little farther out west to Buckeye, to Verado. And I remember you know, oh, the only CrossFit we do is at the fire station. They had the affiliate finder map, and all of a sudden one day, you know, I used to check that map all the time, waiting for new CrossFit gyms to open up. All of a sudden one day it says CrossFit Fury, and there's a little star on the map. It's in Goodyear. It's right down the road from the house. I'm like, oh, I can't wait. Can't wait. So I drove over there. And the guys were in there actually welding together a pull-up rig. So I, you know, I met the owner, Peter Edgen, um, introduced myself, said, hey, I can't wait. You know, As soon as you guys are open, I want to be here. They opened up, and I was member number one there. And that was my first real CrossFit gym experience outside so, of the fire So station. member number one at that. And I remember you were telling me when we were, we were talking on the phone. You are like, yeah, I'm going to – there's this guy. He has like a, like a storage unit. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what it was. Yeah, it was and a, he's putting a CrossFit gym in there, and I'm going to be their first member. We're at their house and their dog's barking, but I like it because we're not editing this out. We're just going to keep it the way it is because this is real. This is oh, just yeah. real. So that's Chloe, their dog Chloe barking. Chloe the golden doodle. Yeah. So she's barking. But anyhow, I remember you have this guy named Peter and you become the first member. And it's funny now, fast forward, you know, nine years, who's the largest gym in Arizona? CrossFit Theory. The one that you yeah, were the one I started at. Yep. The first member at. So I think that's so unique that, all right. You have this passion for CrossFit. You're the first member at now what is the largest gym in Arizona. And by the way, you're not doing too bad yourselves. We're going to talk about that. So the next one I want to go into is Lisa. So Brian's doing all this CrossFit, right? He's he's coming home telling you he meets this amazing friend named Chris, and they're doing CrossFit <laughs> together. And uh, no, Peach, right? Because I don't think oh, you yeah. knew my first name in the beginning. Never. It's always Peach. Yeah. yeah. So they're doing all these CrossFit things. We're having fun. So what are you doing? Are you CrossFitting with him? No. I was – blowing smoke in his face as he would run by because I was a smoker. And I thought it was super annoying that he spent all of his time on the computer trying to learn movements. It was the most annoying thing to me. <laughs> I remember that too. We should probably... I thought, was, I thought it was kind of annoying too because it would be like we'd get back from a call sometimes at like midnight and he'd be, I, I just got to check this this movement real quick. <laughs> like, I'm like, Geez. or wait for the wad to come up. When's it, when are they going to post yeah. the wad? Oh, by always. the way, for anybody that doesn't know about CrossFit, wad... Workout of day, workout yep. of the day. So yeah. that's um, posted every night. Yep. I can distinctly remember when he was trying to figure out what a push jerk is. So a push jerk is kind of a movement exclusive or was exclusive to CrossFit at the time, yeah. like weightlifting. <laughs> and he couldn't find a movement demo for push jerk. So he's trying to figure out what it is, like for days it seemed like that wasn't that long. it was a while <laughs> it was so annoying so he's like i'm trying to figure out push jerk so i walked over to him and pushed him and told him that's your push jerk yeah, you've I got like it, it. Still i like it that's funny that it is, is pretty funny well we should probably talk about his first actual workout in a crossfit gym what i was doing while he was working okay out. it's yeah. so embarrassing yep. now well yeah right before fury opened we were we were up north uh at our, you know lisa's grandparents have a cabin in williams so we would go in flagstaff and there was a crossfit gym there so Fury wasn't open yet, so I'm like, hey, I gotta go work out in a real gym. Workout was terrible. I still remember what it was. It was my first time in a gym. It was three rounds of an 800 meter run, 21 pull ups, 21 thrusters, 21 kettlebell swings. 
So I leave the gym on my run, and Lisa, who was not happy that I drug her into the city to sit there while I worked out for 45 minutes, was smoking right outside the door, and I would run through her cloud of smoke every time I would come out and go on my run. So embarrassing. So embarrassing. So I'll be honest with you. I remember going to your house when we first met. Andrea and I would go to your – you had us over for dinner. And I remember you kept taking smoke breaks. And it was so funny because Brian never told me you smoked. I think he did that on purpose. Yeah, it's not something I was proud of. And uh, so he's like this fitness guru. He's all you know j- jacked and shredded. And we're sitting there at the table. And you're out there taking a break, come back in, taking a break. So you said it. You you mentioned it. I'm glad you did because I, I, I think that's important. I think it's important. Well, I'll, I'll explain why this is important here in a minute. It's about transformation. So, okay. How did you drag, I'm going to say drag, how did you drag Lisa into your CrossFit world? Um, you know, I think it just took a while. It was after Cameron was born, our second child. We have two kids, Colton's 10, Cameron's five. And CrossFit Fear was really good about doing fundraisers for the community. And that's kind of where we, you know, we, we got that from. We like to do it. But there was a fundraiser for a fallen police officer, and it was done in Verado at Verado High School. And I'm like, hey, just come do it with me. You know, she's like, okay, I'll give it a try. And it was done on the football field. It was some running, some lunges, some burpees, nothing crazy. And it kicked her butt. That was pretty much where she, I wouldn't say fell in love with it. Because I don't think she loves the workouts and doing it. I think she just loves the byproduct of it um, and the way it makes her look. I mean, she can kind of go, you know, expand out from there. But that was her first real CrossFit experience was that fundraiser. Yeah, I, uh, I quit smoking. On Christmas Day of 2010 for my son, Colton, he was, what, five years old at the time, four years old, and he was really starting to hate that I smoked because I never smoked around him, but I would leave him in the house and I would go outside and smoke and he would stand at the window and want me to come in. So I finally decided to quit smoking and that was my Christmas gift to him. So I stopped smoking and then immediately got pregnant with Cameron within like six weeks after that. And after I had quit smoking, Brian tried to show me some CrossFit workouts in the park And I had done a couple, you know, just trying to get in shape, get my lungs back. And then I found out I was pregnant and I had a high risk pregnancy. So I didn't work out at all while I was pregnant. And then after Cameron was born, I was taking a police citizens academy in Buckeye. Uh, Rolando Tirado was killed. And so there was a fundraiser that was going on uh, to help his family go to police week. And I was trying to help with the fundraiser and then Fury got involved with it. So then I started talking to Peter to help do this fundraiser. And I actually went and worked out and that was my first workout. And you loved it or no? I didn't love it. No, I still don't love working out. But that day, Peter and Amy, who was the manager, they were so nice to me. And I knew them out because Brian had gone to Fury for so long. I told them that I would be there that Wednesday at the 5 a.m. class. I gave my word. So I committed to it. And I went and I did my first workout in a gym that following week. Wow. And then did you sign up right then? I did. I signed up. I just did their basics class, which is similar to our CrossFit 101 class. I did it three days a week, and I remember that first workout explicitly because I never worked out. Um, I never went to a gym. I never – fitness was not part of my life. I did not grow up with fitness. I was actually a really sick child, so I wasn't allowed to do PE or any of those things. But when I did my first workout at Fury that day, I had to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I worked out at 5 o'clock, and I came home and took a nap before I got in the shower to go to work at 8 a.m. because I thought I was going to die. And at that time, what were you doing for work? I uh, was managing my mom's insurance agencies, and I was selling real estate. Okay, doing both. Mm -hmm. So one thing I will say is you are an extreme hustler. I will say that from knowing you over the last 10 years, the amount of discipline you have to just straight up work, work, work is, is beyond impressive. You know, I have had two jobs since I was in high school. I've always had two jobs. And I think it's because I grew up with teenage parents. My mom was 18 and my dad was 17. And we were very poor growing up, as teenage parents would be. My little sister was born when I was three, so my mom had two children by the time she was 21 years old. She never was able to go to college, even though she's extremely bright and talented. Um, My dad was a truck driver, and then my mom started working in an insurance agency as a receptionist when I was a child, and she worked her way up to own it, but I remember what it was like to grow up and struggle. And so starting my senior year, I had two jobs. I went to high school during the day. 
I would get out of school. I had seventh hour home. I would get out of school and I would go work for the town of Buckeye Monday through Friday from like 2.30 to 5. And then on the weekends, on Saturdays and Sundays, I was a waitress. And I have continued like that my entire life. So I have always had one job and then had my side hustle, no matter what it is. Always. I still do. Always. You've never shared that with me. No? So I didn't know that. So that's why I'm glad we're doing this. Is <laughs> I, I've always wondered, I'm like, why does she have so much drive? You know, mm-hmm. well above average on, on, the, on the drive factor. I mean, it's like before the sun comes up and after the sun goes down, you are doing it, right? You are working. Yeah. Just, I think it's just part of your life. Like you said, it's always been that way. I don't know how to do it differently. I mean, even when I was in college, I worked, I drove from Buckeye to ASU. I worked for Golden Eagle, which is the Budweiser distributor in Buckeye during the week. And on Saturdays and Sundays, I drove a beverage cart at a a golf course. I think the only time in my life I didn't have two jobs is when we worked for Hensley, just because we worked seven yeah, days a week. A full, yeah, that was... But as soon as I left Hensley in 2004, I got my real estate license, and I have always sold real estate in conjunction with whatever my other job has been for almost 13 years. Wow. All right, so we're going to transition now into you guys becoming full-on entrepreneurs. It's an amazing story. So here's what I remember of it, and tell me if you remember this too. It started off kind of in my mind as, You know, when we worked, Brian, separate from the separate sides of the city and we lived on opposite sides of the city, we probably only saw each other twice, three times a year. Yeah. I remember you invited us to your son Colton's birthday party at this this pool that you guys rented out. So we went swimming and I remember I got there and I remember in my head, I'm thinking like, holy cow, Brian is absolutely shredded. And Lisa, you were pregnant, right? I was. You were pregnant. So Brian is, I mean, he is just like this. (laughs) He's like something you see in a muscle fitness magazine. And I'm like, what the heck? I don't remember this. (laughs) I don't remember this. So I, you know, I see you and then like a good friend does, and I think this was important. This was, this was monumental in my, uh, (laughs) my growth is I had kind of taken some time off from fitness. I went to Globo gyms and that's where you go. The Globo gyms are the biggest gyms, you know, that you can, that you've heard of. And I go to these gyms and my fitness routine was, you know, doing a set of bench press and then looking at myself in the mirror for 20 minutes and then doing a set (laughs) of curls and looking at myself in the mirror. And so I gained weight. I gained lots of weight. So that was looking back. That was the heaviest I ever was. I was, I was fat. And I remember you looked at me and you said, what are you doing? You are so fat. <laughs> I, I remember did. thinking like. I remember we were standing right in front of the pool. Yeah. And I'm, I have a beer in my hand. I got this big old belly. And I'm thinking to myself, I am? <laughs> <laughs> and I asked Andrea. She's like, no, oh, you're not fat. But she kind of said it like, yeah, you are. You know. So that, that got me back in the fitness routine. So I'm, I'm now going back online to CrossFit.com because there was no gym in my area for CrossFit. Right. None, none. So I'm going online. I'm just getting back into CrossFit. And then I remember I get a text from you saying, Hey, we're going to, Lisa and I are going to be in your area. Would you meet us for lunch? I'm like, sure. Yeah, we'll meet you for lunch. So we met over at Red Robin. Andrea and I are slamming French fries and, you know, <laughs> and, you know, what milkshakes. And you guys are eating this real clean diet. And I'm like, hmm, you know, I, I noticed that right away. So all of a sudden you just, you know, how are things going? Blah, blah, blah. Hey, by the way, we are going to start our own CrossFit gym. And we're going to do it in your area. And I remember thinking, whoa, okay, like out of nowhere. So we talked about that. I'm like, I, you know, I said, I think there's some buildings over here you should go check out, which. Yeah. You actually told us where to go look. Yeah. And you went and looked. And then yep. later that day, I think I got a text saying, hey, we signed a lease. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, yeah. I don't know if it was that. I remember I sent you a picture and said, hey, thank you. This is CrossFit and sending This is going to be the location. And uh, it took a little longer than that to actually get the spot and get into that building. It was kind of a hassle. But. I do remember that lunch vividly, you know, and I said, hey, you know, I remember I asked you, I said, hey, I want you to be a part of it. This and I think you're just like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, just kind of humoring me at the time. And uh, yeah, as soon as we left there, we went driving and looking for spots and went to that uh, complex that you told us. And that's where CrossFit Sandia still is today. So you guys had this idea. You and Lisa had this idea like, hey, I'm so passionate about this CrossFit thing. What if we what if we started our own, you know, and the whole what if. Thing. I mean, so many of us always think, what would it be like if we do this? What would it be like if we did that? What if, what if, what if? How many people actually take that next step and do that, right? I mean, that's – that. so when you're, when you're telling us, you know, we're thinking about well, – you, know, you told us we're starting a CrossFit gym. I, I was like, that's so cool. But in my head, I was like, we'll see. And then like literally maybe a few days later, you're like, yeah, we got a spot, you know. So here's what's really cool about this. How did you start this business? Did you cash flow it? Did you go into debt for it? 
What, how did you do this? We sold everything pretty much. So back in that time too, we weren't, we didn't know who Dave Ramsey was. We just kind of figured it out. Um, there was no money peach to help us out back then. So we were heavily in debt. So we started selling stuff. We had a uh, Polaris Ranger that we sold, took that cash, uh, but we also sold our house. House is. Mm-hmm. House is. Yeah. We had two houses out in Barado. Uh, we had a rental home and we had our primary home and we sold that and used the cash to cash flow to get in the gym. You know, it was on the way up still. It, was, it hadn't peaked, but it wasn't, and it wasn't brand new, but it hadn't peaked yet. It wasn't the popular that it is today. So we were still nervous too. We we're like, hey, we, you know, we can't take out, you know, no, first of all, no one's going to give us a loan. I'm just a fireman. Uh, mm-hmm. No one's going to give us a big loan. Second of all, I'm like, if it fails, you know, I don't want to owe anybody money. So what we did, we just, we sold our houses, picked up the family, and moved them across the city um, where we knew you, and that was really about it. And uh, found a house and dumped all that money into the gym, into you know putting down down payment on the you know first month's rent on the lease, and started buying equipment. And that was how we opened the gym. Are you tired of living paycheck to paycheck? Are you lying in bed awake at night wondering how you're going to pay the next bill, how you're going to save for kids' college, how you're going to pay off that debt, and when are you going to take that dream vacation that you guys have been talking about forever? Well, stop worrying about it and head on over to AwesomeMoneyCourse.com and see why students all over the world are now taking back control of their money. They're now in the driver's seat of their financial future. AwesomeMoneyCourse.com awesomemoneycourse.com I remember Andrew and I went out to dinner with the kids and then afterwards I said hey let's go swing by Brian's place I want to go see and I remember it was like I don't know maybe 9 at night late I shouldn't have the kids up that late but I did terrible parent but it's 9 at night and I remember I, I walk in and you guys are you know on your hands and knees bolting stuff together I mean this was you didn't hire a big production company to build CrossFit Incendia. I mean, I, when it started, I mean, it was labor of love. You guys did it from the ground up. Was, oh, yeah. Well, and we still lived in Buckeye. So we would have to, we would keep the kids at the gym really, really late. And then we would have to drive home every night because we hadn't officially made the move to this side of town yet. Yeah, there was countless nights where the kids, you know, fell asleep on the floor, like on a mat in the floor in the middle of the gym that was still being built and they were just asleep crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, so, and the reason why I want you guys to talk about that is because, you know, starting a business is not easy, right? It's not easy at all. I mean, that's why so many people I think fail. 90% of startups fail the first three years, right? And so how many years are we in now? We're going on five. Just going on five up. years. Knowing you personally, I think a lot of people that were going to the gym, they didn't get to see the behind the scenes. And that's why I wanted you guys to come on the show to talk about that is because whether you know Brian and Lisa from the gym or whether you're on the other side of the country or the world, you've never met them. I just want you guys to understand that watching them was impressive because, you know, you have two young kids. How old was Cam? She was not quite a year old yet. She was about 11 months. Okay. So you have 11 month old Colton's five Five. or six at the time. Yeah. Okay. Five or six years old. Brian's working 56 hours a week at the fire department, Mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a firefighter and you're working at a busy station. So you're, you know, you're not getting any sleep. You are still having to do a little bit of real estate in the beginning because day one, you don't bring in income. No. And I still had an office job too. So I was working 40 hours a week, eight to five, Monday through Friday. There you go. And then you have this gym, right? When was the opening? November of 2012. November, 2012. So you have this opening and I remember the only people that were there day one maybe was, I think, 90% of people you knew and maybe some... some Yeah. Yeah. We actually did have a few people come in day people. one. Tish, yep, Tish and Julia and Esteban, Esteban and who, his who's wife. Your, who are now two of them that are coaches. Yeah. And they're all still members. Yeah. And I remember doing this. We were working out together. And um, I can't remember what the initial workout is. I'm probably... You probably remember. But I remember we were working out and you looked at me and you're like... Man, I hope this works. We're we're all in, and I'm oh, like, yeah. I sure hope it works too. Oh yeah. yeah. So okay, so in the very beginning, right? You're this is you're building this gym, and then I remember all of a sudden, it was like the place to be instantly. The place to be. Your growth in the beginning was tremendous. Tell me about that. That was so hard to manage. You know, looking back. I wish that we wouldn't have grown so quickly because we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't even have a chance to figure things out. We didn't have systems. We didn't have employees. We didn't have 
a budget. We didn't have anything. So when we hit our 100 member mark, we were ecstatic. And then when we hit 200, within just like a month later, we were ecstatic. And then it went 300, 400, 500 really, really quickly. And so explain how quickly we are here. I would say we were at 500 members inside of a year. Yeah, right around a year, I think. Yeah. And, and, and a normal, I mean, I think it's pretty standard. What's a normal CrossFit membership standard? What would you say? Like 150, It's maybe? hard to say, yeah. I mean, you know, the cool thing about CrossFit, it's, there, there's CrossFit gyms everywhere now. So it's, it's hard to say. Some are big, some are small. Fury still one of, you know, I think it's the largest gym in Arizona. Um, I'm not sure what their member base is, but it's, you know, larger than ours. So I think, you know, there's some smaller ones too that just have, you know, two or three people in each class. So it's just, it's hard to tell. But the reason why I want to bring that up is when you guys told me about CrossFit, you know, and you're talking about how you're going to create this, this, this brand, create Incendia. And I'm thinking in my mind, there's, there's a gym down the street that charges 20 bucks a month, right? For unlimited. How are you guys going to sell a product that's 150? And within a year you had 500 mm-hmm. people. It's the community, 100%. It was about the community that we created. And that was our goal going in. We wanted to create a community and we were doing that through fitness. You know, fitness was kind of secondary, although it is the the main component. It was all about the community and we really wanted a vehicle to support the causes that we cared about. So we were really into fundraising and doing that type of thing. And we knew that we would be able to utilize our gym to meet the needs to help people outside of it. Absolutely. So I know you're, you're not going to toot your own horn, so I'm going to do it for you. So, I mean, we have had at, the, at our gym that we go to countless friendships created that are like these lifelong friendships. You have had people get married, right? You've had people have children yeah. through meeting at the gym. You've had businesses formed, relate, I mean, partnerships formed from people at the gym. I could definitely say just from the feedback we get, you know, through the community site, we've had people literally say, you saved my life. Not metaphorically speaking, like literally, I was going to die if I didn't, you know, join this community for, you know, for mental health reasons, physical health reasons, and all the above. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, you know, they don't understand CrossFit, right? They don't understand. They say, I just don't get how you, people are willing to spend $150 to work out. I said, they don't spend $150 to work out. Working out is part of it. It's this community. So how did you learn to grow a community? That's, that's what I'm trying to think of here is how did you learn to grow this community? Because think about whoever's listening right now. Think about if you have a business or you have you know an idea for a business and you don't have a community to attach to that business, you're missing the boat. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Is like they come from across the valley. They know no one. And within a year, within a couple months, you had 100 members. Did. It was because people wanted to be part of something. They didn't want to join a gym to work out. They wanted to join the gym and be part of something. And they still do. I mean, this this community is crazy strong. That's true. That's true. You know, there wasn't anything that we did strategically to grow the community. I hate to say that. Well, you had your, you had, I would say the private Facebook group. There for, is. That was yeah. huge. There is. But I mean, we didn't go into it with a plan. We were just ourselves, you know, and we care about people and we care about the things that are important to them. And we like making connections with people and it just worked. <laughs> I wish there was a plan, so, but there wasn't. And I will say, this is actually pretty cool. So I remember, like you just said it perfectly, like we were just ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. And when you are yourself, I don't think you have to try to be anybody else. It's just a lot easier. So I remember in the beginning, I didn't mind it, but there was people that would come in and they didn't like the swear words of the music. People were like saying to you, like, I don't like how you have music playing that has explicit lyrics. And what was your response to that? Well, at, at first, I don't think that we were willing to budge on it too much. We were like, it is what it is. But as things went on and we, we heard about it a lot more, we try to censor the music by the environment, by, by whatever the class is. So if it's a kid's class or if it's the Incendia Athletics, our teens class, 100% the music is censored. I have children that attend those classes too. Our 8 a.m. class likes some like gangster rap, but our 9 a.m. moms like boy bands. So we just kind of tailor the music to whatever the class is. So we don't want to offend anybody. And if censoring music helps people to not be offended, then we're cool with that. 
And that's, the truth is you can't please everybody. That right? is true. With 500 members, I mean, you're going to have some people that say in your suggestion box, I want music with the F word. And you're going to have some people say no, and you can't please everybody. Oh, right? And we have had both. Yeah, you've had. <laughs> exactly. I remember the survey. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Okay, so we talked about extreme success, right? I mean, this is, it was like you guys hit the hockey stick analogy where, you know, the first couple of weeks, maybe a month, it's this slow, steady growth, and all of a sudden it went gangbusters. So you're growing like crazy, mm-hmm. right? Like tremendous. I mean, 500 members within a year. Second largest gym in Arizona. The only gym that's bigger than you is the one you came from. True. By the way, yeah. So, mm-hmm. and I think at the time, I remember reading there was 90 CrossFit gyms in the Phoenix area, or was it Arizona? That's probably Arizona. I want to say 50-ish, 40, 50 in the Valley. Yeah. So we're, we're talking, you guys went from not knowing anybody in this area to growing a gym that was number two in all of Arizona, size-wise. I mean, tremendous. I mean, you drive up and down the freeways here in Phoenix, and you'll see a CrossFit Incendia sticker on the back of a window. I mean, like it's just crazy to see this, this growth. Brian's a firefighter, right? You're running your mom's, you know, uh, your insurance business, doing real estate, but you, you never went to entrepreneur school. No. No, I mean, no. <laughs> you never went to how to start a CrossFit Incendia gym school. No. And actually we just hired a coach for the first time five years later. A business coach. Yes. Okay. Very cool. I think that's very important. So, okay. So now I want to talk about the mistakes, the challenges, what you had to overcome, because, you know, this wouldn't be fair to just talk about, oh, yeah, you, you had this idea and everything went perfect. And now you have this wonderful gym. I mean, when with success comes pain, right? And everybody I've had on this podcast that is extremely successful talks about the pain they had to go through to even move it further than they thought imaginable. It is like the common theme. John Gaston talks about that in episode 38. George Lawton talks about that in episode 42. Ben Arredondo talks about that in episode 30. Nate Adams talks about that in episode 33. All these people had to go through some, some pretty painful moments, some mistakes they made to learn. And we don't like going through them. Then we look back on that actually helped us grow our business. Can you share any, I mean, was it all unicorns and rainbows for you guys? Not no? at all. We grew so quickly that we almost had the bottom blown out from underneath us a couple times. So the first year we were spending $10,000 a month in equipment, just trying to keep up with the demand. And, um, we, at first we weren't able to pay our coaches. So we had to trade them for memberships and we quickly had to transition into, you know, paying people. What else? Oh, personally, we had everything on the line. I had my car repossessed. That's something that a lot of people don't know about. So when we when we first opened the gym, we didn't have any money. I had quit my job at my mom's insurance agency, and I was too busy to sell real estate. So I wasn't bringing in any income whatsoever. We actually had food stamps to eat on at the beginning because we were so broke. So I used our food stamps to buy food for the family and I wasn't able to make my car payment. So my car got repossessed and I rode a bike for months because we couldn't afford to buy a car. And you put the kids in the bike trailer. I put the kids in the bike trailer in July and I would take Cameron to school from my house, which was a couple of miles one way. And then I would ride the bike to the gym with Colton, which was a couple of miles the other way. And then at the end of the day, I would repeat that process and go pick Cameron up at the school. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And I want you guys listening to just kind of think about this in your mind, all right? They at one point they were living in Buckeye. They had two houses. You know, they have a great income. They're not struggling financially. They start this gym. They have tremendous growth. Everybody on the outside looking in is, is thinking, Oh, they're so rich. They're so rich. They're just, they're killing it. You know, Oh, you know, it, they, they got so lucky and they are working. I mean, 56 hours a week as a firefighter. Then when they're not working, you know, 12 to 14 hour days at the gym coaching nonstop. Lisa's doing three different things, taking her kids to school in a bike in Arizona with a bike trailer. I mean, we're talking and, and they're on food stamps for a little bit and they got their car repossessed. So think about that for a second. Put yourself in that position. What would that feel like? What would that look like in your life if you went from having, you know, a, a comfortable life to then going all in, putting all effort in, putting tons of energy, tons of time in, and your car gets repossessed, right? And you're going through these growing pains. I mean, think about that. Would you, would you make it? And, and I don't know if the answer is yes or no. I just ask yourself, 
could you handle that, right? Could you handle that kind of kind of stress, especially with having a family? Yeah, it was tough. And actually, a couple of our members saw my car get repossessed. Yeah, remember that? That was a you know that's a that was a pretty tough morning because I had to go out and get the you know get Cameron's car seat out and get all our stuff out. You know, we had the car and we, we knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were behind. You know, every penny that we brought in from the gym went right back into the gym. Like you said, every month we're spending five to ten thousand dollars a month on on barbells, boxes. Rowers, equipment, just stuff we needed. We started off with the bare minimum. We had four rowers, four boxes, you know, maybe eight barbells. So if we had a decent sized class, we were, you know, stressed out. Okay, how am I going to run this class? Oh, we got to change the workout on the fly, or we got to partner it up, or, you know, run waves. So every penny that came in went right back out. So it yeah, it was, that was, I remember that morning. It was, that sucked. It was. And then when, once we had enough money, we got one month ahead on our rent at the gym because we knew that the one thing that would put us out of business was not being able to pay the rent. So we knew that we had to keep the doors open to make money to get to a different spot. So we took, you know, $8,000 or whatever it was, and we paid a month ahead of rent. And we stayed that way for several years because we knew that we would have 30 days to figure out something to turn things around if things went south on us. Wow. I mean, that's an incredible story. And nobody knows this, right? Everybody, I remember people, um, I remember we, you and I had talked about the car getting repoed. And, you know, I know you at the same time, you're dealing with, you know, people are like, oh, hey, Brian, it must be nice having this great gym. And you're oh, like, yeah. my every, wife's every riding a bike. Drove into yeah. I, oh, why are you here today? You're making too much money at the gym. You don't need to be here. And exactly. They had no idea. No idea that your wife is riding a bike. <laughs> And if you guys live in Phoenix, it is not comfortable here during the year sometimes. I mean, it is, <laughs> it is brutal. I mean, it was like 110 degrees. So um, that, that's just an amazing story. I'm, and I didn't know you were going to share that. I'm glad you did because I think it makes it relatable, right? People, I think, I think a lot of people say, oh, it must be nice for so-and-so. You know, it, you know, they're an overnight success. And there was some challenges. You know, there's, there's still is challenges, still right, is. every day. Yeah, there still is. I mean, that was just a very dark period of my life. I had student loans that were insane from my master's degree. And my mom had co-signed on a couple of them and I didn't have the money to pay the student loans. And so I defaulted on all of them, except my mom was making the payments on the ones that she had co-signed on. And she stopped talking to me because she was very angry that I was not paying the loans and she was being held accountable for them. And she probably didn't talk to me for a year until I paid off all those student loans. Tough love. It was bad. But hey, <laughs> I will tell you this. I think just from meeting your mom and talking a little bit, a lot of your toughness comes from your mom. It absolutely, oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. I mean, it, you don't put up with a lot, right? <laughs> true, true. But I mean, 100%. She's brilliant and she still works seven days a week. She's in her 60s. She owns multiple insurance agencies. I was raised to work and to never rely on anybody. And I'm raising my children exactly the same way. Now, looking back, the gym's going to be five years old soon. Mm -hmm. So looking back, if you guys could have buttoned up some things, made some changes, if you, if you could have a do-over, would you change anything or would you keep it the way it was because that's how you got to the point where you're at now? It's hard to say. I mean – you know, I always try to say no just because you don't get do overs in life. So mm -hmm. I say no. But I mean, obviously, yeah, we had made some big mistakes, you know, and we never had, we've neither of us owned a business before. So it was new for us. So mm -hmm. we learned a lot of things the hard way. You know, we lost friendships over certain stuff. And no, I wouldn't because I can't. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's the easy answer. But of course, I mean, there's tons of stuff we would have changed. I mean, just getting systems in place and, you know, maybe creating boundaries and just. Looking Endless. back, do you think maybe if you could have controlled the rate of growth, you would have slowed it down a little bit? You remind me a lot of when John Gass on episode 38 shares a story about how they grew so fast and he just, it was so fast. They didn't have any time to put infrastructure in yeah, place. Exactly. And exactly. it eventually tipped over. Yeah. yeah. We right? Exactly. You know, when I listen to that, that story from when John was telling on your podcast, I'm like, yeah, that we relate to that 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we would, I think if we were able to go back, it was just so hard to carve out an extra few minutes to do things that would solidify the business. So we would have systems in place. We would have hired an HR consultant earlier. 
I think that we probably wouldn't have expanded when we did. We, but how would you have known, right? We oh, wouldn't yeah. have known. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have known. So I think that there's definitely some things that we would have done differently, even with the class schedule. You know, we look back now and we used to just add classes. If somebody said, Hey, I really want to work out at this time, we'd be like, boom, there's a class. We mm-hmm. wouldn't look at it um, at the expense or, you know, what it actually costs to offer that service. We just wanted to please. Not, you know, please everybody too, you know, it's like, because we're friends with everyone on our gym. That's the hardest part too, is that you're friends with everybody. So, hey, you know, I can't make this class. We'll we'll put another one for you. No big deal. Without looking at the back end costs. Okay. We got to staff it with a coach, you know, the electricity would be on longer, you know, just, it goes exponentially from there. So it, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's a very unique business model because if you think about it, there's not many businesses where you have such a friendly relationship with almost all of your customers. I mean, if you know, if you own a restaurant, they're not coming in every single day, right? If you, you know, if you own a construction business, you're not really building those relationships, right? But with you, I mean, your members are your extended family. They come in every single day and you work out with them, right? You guys are in their class working out with them. And then we have the community events. We do the bike rides. We do the fundraisers. Uh, we do the wads, you know, together, the big, uh, not the tournaments, but, you know, our competitions that we do together. And so your customers aren't really customers. They're almost like extended family members. I mean, Absolutely. you know them personally to a point where you're definitely in a unique situation because you don't have the same opportunities to do certain things that maybe somebody that owns a air conditioning business or a construction business, right? If you cut ties with somebody that, you know, isn't fitting the gym or fitting what's going on with, with you guys, it's more personal than it is customer based. Does that, do you feel like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, we have to protect the culture of the gym because the, the culture and the community is more important than the fitness aspect of it, in our opinion. And if there is somebody who is not a fit or who is bringing down the culture or creating a divide, we have a few times had to make very hard decisions to remove that person from the culture. And we've had to do that. Other owners have had to do it. And it is very painful, you know, on our end because it always turns personal. Um, and it, that's not something that we enjoy doing, but we have to do it to protect the community. Being an entrepreneur is not easy. No. <laughs> it's not supposed to be easy. If it was easy, then everybody would be a successful entrepreneur and everybody would be like, this is the greatest thing in the world. You have to make tough decisions. I mean, you know, one thing that's amazing to me, absolutely amazing is, so partnerships are tough, right? When you have a business partner, it's tough. But when you have a business partner that you raise children with, that you share a bed with, that you see, okay, now every day at home, but now every day at work, how did you guys make it work? Because that's very, very difficult. You know, I think we just we just get along really well. I mean, we actually enjoy each other's company. We work well together. We have strengths and weaknesses. There's certain stuff that Lisa's really good at that I'm not good at. There's stuff that I'm good at that she's not, you know, that she doesn't like to do or she's not as good at. So, I mean, I think that helps. And we've always, you know, we've always gotten along really well. I mean, even before opening the business, you know, we've always been really good friends uh, first. So it made it a little bit easier. And, but there are some tough times. See, we, 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 but we'll butt heads when it comes to certain stuff at the gym, the way, you know, I think something needs to be versus the way she needs, thinks it needs to be. So we'll butt heads sometimes. She's usually right, but <laughs> <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Yeah. yeah. I just, I know for a fact that I could not do this without him. Like he said, there's things that he's strong at that I, I lack in and vice versa. And I wouldn't want to do this with anybody else. He is the only person that I would ever want to do this venture with. By the way, I just want to throw out there that um, it's been amazing watching you guys do this together because you look at how far you've come. I mean, just in this 45 minute conversation we've had, I mean, it was literally hanging from a branch, right? With pull up, (laughs) pull up rings to a red Robin lunch to pulling the trigger, going all in, selling everything, going broke during the process, still having to work. Raising two kids, dealing with, you know, when you have 500 members, I mean, people listening out there understand if you have 500 friends, I promise you out of those 500 friends, you're going to have some disagreements with some of those people, right? And it's elevated when there is, you know, membership, money, you know, community involvement, everything is, you know, it just elevates it going through that, managing through that, moving your whole entire family to a community where you know nobody, right? And 
coming out on the other out on the other side, still married, stronger than ever, with a killer gym, a killer community. I mean, Incendia is no longer a gym. I mean, when people say Incendia, it's right next to the word in their mind, family. I mean, Andrea and I just went on a vacation for six days in an island in the Caribbean, and when hundred percent of the people that went on that vacation did not know each other before CrossFit Incendia. I mean, there were six six families, twelve people we'd never had heard of each other before CrossFit Incendia. We've been to weddings, and they met at CrossFit Incendia. There's children now that were born via CrossFit Incendia. That's the kind of stuff that makes it worth it too. You know that it kind does. of stuff. And- yeah. You know, hearing people get healthy, obviously, you know, we've had people say, hey, I, I was on diet pills for years and I'm off those now and I'm healthy. I'm not, you know, I don't have these issues with food that I once have, you know, I know I don't have body issues. So that's, you know, that and the community make it all worth it. The value you guys have provided. And I think it goes back to, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, focus on the value first. Well, what value are you going to bring? If you bring enough value into people's lives, you're going to get paid for it, right? And that is the focus. I think a lot of times I know interviewing other people. And even myself, sometimes you look at what are the numbers, you know, very, very closely. And that's important, but the numbers are not going to matter if there's no value involved. And so, like you said, I mean, people are, their lives are changed forever because of Incendia, whether, whether, you know, they CrossFit, you know, for the rest of their lives, by the way, I just want to throw this out there. My mom is, I don't want to say her age because she would beat (laughs) me up. So I'm 34. So put the numbers together. (laughs) So my mom CrossFits. And so when people out there say, you know, CrossFit is for the younger generation, it's for, you know, extreme endurance athletes. My mom was like Lisa, had never worked out once in her life. And I don't know how I convinced her, but she showed up to the CrossFit gym almost two years ago. And she's 58. And so (laughs) she shows up to the CrossFit gym and she CrossFits. She doesn't do the beginner class. She does the CrossFit class. She does power cleans. She does, you know, overhead squats. And she's in the best shape of her life at 58. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking, you know, I don't know if it's for me, try it because it's designed for everybody. It, so. it, it, it is. It's, it's infinitely scalable. And, you know, I plan to be doing them on 58, 68, 78. You know, it's obviously not going to be the level I'm at now. I'm still going to do functional movements, still going to be jumping on boxes, swinging the kettlebells. I'm going to be stepping on the boxes, but I'll be getting up there. And if you look at the growth of CrossFit, every single year they do this thing called the Open, where it's all the CrossFit athletes on the globe, you know, on Earth, planet Earth, sign up online for this thing. And we all do the same workouts for five weeks. And then it's the intro to what you guys see in the CrossFit games in July. And every single year since its inception, it has grown. And it keeps growing and it keeps growing. And I heard somebody say the other day, I wonder when it's going to peak. And I don't know when it's going to peak because every single year there's growth. There's more and more. And it's, it's not your community. It's worldwide. So thank you guys. We're coming up on time. Thank you so much for coming to the show. I have a couple of questions I want to ask Brian real quick, any books, podcasts, or anything like that you would recommend to our listeners? Uh, books. My favorite is how to win friends and influence people. Dale Carnegie. Mm -hmm. I think I've recommended that to you a few times. It's by far my favorite book. It's time for me to read it again. Tools of Titans, I finished up a couple months ago, which is an amazing book, which gave me three or four more books to read at mm-hmm. least out of there. Um, podcast, I listen to Brute Strength a lot just because it's in you know my our industry of fitness. Um, they interview some good guests. Money Peach Podcast is great. And Order of Man, I've been listening to the Order of Man and the Good Dad Project are some other ones I like. Okay, so we'll have links to all of that in the show notes. Lisa, what about you? One of the things that we didn't talk about but that's really important to me is I quit drinking almost 300 days ago. So all of my books and podcasts really center around alcohol recovery. So one of my favorites is The Naked Mind by Annie Grace. That one is life-changing about alcohol. And then I listen to The Share Podcast and Recovery Elevator. Those are two of my favorites. And then on the business side of things, I really like Barbell Business and I also listen to 321 Go Project quite a bit. And those are like running gym business podcasts. Okay. So we'll have show notes of that. Do you read books or do you listen to books? I listen to books. I can't seem to read books. I can't quiet my mind long enough. But I listen to books and I listen to podcasts. Brian and I just went to San Diego and our poor children, they hate us because all we listen to are podcasts the entire drive. Our kids are used to that as well. All right, last question I have for you guys is what is on your home screen of your phone? Kids. Always my kids. Your kids? Mine is me and Colton. Okay, so both of you have your kids. Very cool. It's always interesting because I always like to ask that question because it's so different. You know, sometimes it's kids, sometimes it's goals, sometimes it's some abstract thing that, you know, only means something to them. So 
All right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming to the show. That was fun. And uh, I know the listeners are, you know, they're going to get a lot out of this because you guys were real, you guys were raw, and you guys killed it because you told the truth. You've done the same thing over and over again where you're just you. You're just you. And um, when you're just you, you have tremendous success. So thanks again for coming to the show. Thank you for having us on. Congratulations on 50. That's awesome. And just so your listeners know that you're no slouch. Um, You did mention the Open. You've beat me every year in the Open. Um, You beat me... More than I beat you in the workout, so you know, so you listen, know you are quite the stud as well. You do beat the gym owner and make me feel bad about myself sometimes. And I actually have a photo of that day at the mansion at the birthday party. And I think what Brian said was that you were soft. Soft. <laughs> All right. And since you do have that photo, we will be putting that photo in the show notes. So I will show you the difference between pre CrossFit and post CrossFit. Awesome. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. And just like that, we wrap up another amazing episode of the Money Peach Podcast. All the show notes, the links, anything that the Vedas and I talked about can be found over at moneypeach.com forward slash session 50. That's moneypeach.com forward slash session 50. Special thanks to my producer, Steve Stewart, my assistant, Kayla Sloan. Without them, this show would not be possible. But more importantly, without you, this show would not be possible. Thank you so much for your support over the last 50 episodes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for downloading. And as a gift, I promise we are going to do another 50 episodes starting today. We'll see you guys next week, same time, same place, with another amazing episode of the Money Peach Podcast. Boom. 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 Boom.